On March the 27th, 1994, this state-of-the-art 21st century Spitfire had its long-awaited maiden flight. Although the test was successful, the political turbulence which the project had to navigate was as perilous as any before it. Through its short history, it has witnessed the fall of the communist Warsaw Pact, and with it, the total rethink of European strategic warfare. It's known by the four nations who built it as the European fighter aircraft, Eurofighter. At the British Aerospace Factory in Wharton, just outside Blackpool, the second of seven flying prototypes was nearing completion. Like some hugely complex plastic kit, the sections being assembled here had come from all over Europe. The tail and the centre fuselage were built in Germany. Part of the rear fuselage was built in Spain, while another part was built in Italy. Italy also built the left wing, but not the right. That was the job of British Aerospace, along with the forward fuselage and the nose. Amazingly, it all knitted seamlessly together, and the engineers were confident that it would fly before Christmas 1992. It had taken nearly 13 years of development and will cost the British nearly 15 million pounds before the plane enters squadron service in the year 2000. But even as the last few systems were being fitted onto the British prototype by technicians drawn from each of the partner countries, the Eurofighter was already running into unforeseen turbulence. Political turbulence. Of the original four-nation requirement for 765 aircraft, both the RAF and the German Luftwaffe said that they each wanted 250. But in the summer of 1992, Germany's politicians declared their intention to pull out of the project once the development phase was over. No. At a stroke, the threat of that action had put 97,000 jobs across Europe at risk, 40,000 of them here in Britain. So why the change of heart? Because, say the Germans, since it was conceived in the chill light of the Cold War in 1983, the need for a high-tech dogfighter has simply gone away, and with it, NATO's nightmare. The horror of that nightmare is appallingly simple. In it, the enemy always wears a Soviet uniform, and the tanks and armored ground forces always pour over the horizon from the east. Bombers are streaking across the North Sea, minutes from the airfields, power stations, ports and radar sites, which are their targets. Five miles in front of those bombers are the latest long-range fighter escorts, the supremely capable Sukhoi 27s, known to NATO as flankers. This unique footage of an exercise held far behind the Iron Curtain shows how the nightmare unfolds. Shorter range bombers and ground attack aircraft are taking to the air over the battlefield, again escorted by fighters. And among some pretty ancient 50s and 60s aircraft are several squadrons of the Soviet Union's latest dogfighter, the MiG-29 Fulcrum. Stationed at frontline bases in former East Germany, these short-range fighters are among the first to greet the NATO air forces. Within minutes, or so our nightmare goes, the skies over Central Europe have become a chaotic melee of spinning and swirling aircraft, dodging missiles, dodging each other, and trying to figure out who's who and who's where. Uh, the Central Front in Europe would have been a very high-tech operation. Uh, lots of uh, electromagnetic type uh, warfare going on. Some very sophisticated surface-to-air missiles around, a very high threat 
to use that jargon, high threat environment, to fly airplanes around it. And uh, some very capable airplanes on the other side that have got to be shot down. As the 80s dawned, it became clear that the nightmare of the previous 20 years, which had been characterized by the overwhelming quantity of Soviet weaponry, was being transformed by the steady addition of technological quality, too. The new MiG-29s, which were entering service in 1983, could climb at 12 miles a minute, cruise at over twice the speed of sound, and were equipped with infrared sensors in their noses and laser rangefinders for their guns. And although at the time the Soviet fighters lacked the computerized flight controls which were being installed in Western aircraft, that weakness was amply offset by highly advanced aerodynamics. One of the designers of the MiG-29 said recently that they began by perfecting the ideal wing for a fighter. No more than that, just the wing. Then they added a couple of engines, a nose and a tail to see how much the ideal wing's performance was compromised. Countless visits to the wind tunnel later, this is what they came up with. A short-range fighter so maneuverable that in the later years of Glasnost, experienced pilots in the West who saw it perform at air shows could barely believe their eyes. Well, having watched the airplane fly at the Farnborough Air Show and then at the Paris Air Show, um, it was self-evident that this aircraft had this ability to abruptly maneuver and pitch in a way that uh, the sort of aircraft I'd flown had not. And, uh, and I was extremely interested to know whether that was a difficult thing to do in the aeroplane or whether it was apparently as easy and as safe as it looked. I talked to the McCoyan people and said I wanted to assess its low speed handling qualities and they were very happy to show those off. Human nature, um, they're proud of it. Uh, it's good, it was world class, and, and it was indeed. It was the easiest jet aeroplane to maneuver at low speed that I have ever flown. I mean, it was, it was more like a training Second World War biplane, you know, in terms of that flexibility and ease of doing maneuvers. Quite unlike any other jet aeroplane I've flown. It's so safe and so straightforward to maneuver at high angles of attack. Even a few years prior to John Farley's unprecedented test drive in 1990, military observers in the West would have given anything for a chance to learn at first hand how the MiG designers had achieved such easily controllable, low-speed maneuverability. But it wasn't just the MiG which could tumble around the sky with such manifest agility. Intelligence reports were suggesting that the same aerodynamic skills which had been brought to bear on the MiG had also found their way into the design of another new interceptor fighter, the Sukhoi Su-27 flanker. Like the MiG, this supersonic aircraft had first taken to the air in 1977. But unlike the MiG, this was a beast with exceptionally long range, St. Petersburg to Grimsby and back on one tank of fuel. This was also the fighter which the long-range NATO interceptors could expect to meet, and its performance was therefore of vital interest. Like the MiG, here was an aircraft whose maneuverability defied description. Nowadays, at air shows, the Sukhoi 27 routinely seems to achieve the impossible, flying at extraordinary angles. But did such aerobatic stunts ever have any real military value? This angle of attack, of course, is, is the difference between the direction the airplane is pointing and the direction it's traveling. I mean, I hate waving my hands about, but when you see an airplane go by like that, you know, it's pointing upwards and it's, it's traveling horizontally. We traditionally see that in a slow pass at an airfield. That angle, that's the, called the angle of attack that the airplane is at. Now, if you're fighting another airplane, um, it is likely that you'll have roughly forward-facing armament in your fighter. 
and it's likely that he will have forward-facing armament in his. And so the name of the game, of course, is to get the other chap in front of you. If he's in front of you, the bad guy, he can't shoot you, and you have an opportunity to shoot him, assuming you can get your aiming solution good enough. But if, on the other hand, he's round the other side of a circle, you're pointing one way, he's pointing another. And he can't shoot you, you can't shoot him, it's a standoff. And so you're manoeuvring to try and get behind the other guy. You feel very safe and relaxed when he's on the other side of a circle. And that circle need not necessarily be in the horizontal. Of course, it can be in any plane. It's still a circle so far as, as air combat manoeuvring is concerned. If this chap, though, has the ability to momentarily point his aeroplane just for a second or two in a totally different direction, perhaps up to 90 degrees from that in which he's traveling, are you going to be relaxed in close combat, knowing that this chap can wipe out a large angular difference very quickly and get a, a short burst off of you? Now, there will be tremendous disadvantages for him doing that, like he will slow down, he'll lose a lot of energy, and he'll be a sort of sitting duck for your mate who may be with you. But is that any consolation to you if he shot you down in the process? And that, after all, is what this gruesome game is all about. But around the time that the Sukhoi flankers and MiG fulcrums were rolling off the Soviet production lines in the early 80s, the NATO air forces were almost entirely equipped with American aircraft. And that wasn't just because there were 31 US Air Force squadrons based in Germany at the time. It was simply that many of Europe's air forces had bought American technology, much of which had survived the test of combat in an earlier encounter, Vietnam. The principal fighter aircraft of that era was the McDonnell Douglas Phantom, which first flew in 1958. Like every fighter plane ever designed, this aircraft ended up spending a lot of its time firing its guns at targets on the ground and dropping bombs somewhere in the vicinity of the enemy. But the Phantom could also hold its own as an air superiority fighter. And by the early 70s, it had entered service with the British Navy and the RAF, as well as a number of other European air forces, such as Germany's Luftwaffe, where they're still in service to this day. By the 80s, Europe's aerospace industry had developed a penchant for its own collaborative ventures, Concorde the Anglo-French Jaguar, the Airbus Civil Airliner, and perhaps most significantly, this, the Tornado, in which Germany, Italy and Britain had all been involved. But the Tornado was never intended to be an air superiority fighter. Its engines were designed for endurance and economy, rather than rapid response or brute power, and its mission was ground attack and long-range interception. It's not a particularly agile machine. Very few bombers are. Back in 1983, what the air forces of Europe were clamoring for was a dogfighter to beat the MiGs and the Sukhois. For many years, the Royal Air Force has wanted an agile fighter. The problem, of course, is affordability and looking for partners and getting the right atmosphere. But the European fighter itself started as an idea, an outline target is the formal word for it, in about 1983. Clearly, at that stage, the main threat was perceived to be the Warsaw Pact, uh, which means USSR aircraft at that stage. Uh, and one looks at the classic and highly successful combat aircraft designers like Mikoyan and Sukhoi, and one says, what are they doing? Uh, and I suppose the, anyone would look at the, the aircraft out there now and say, one of the aircraft you've surely got to be capable of matching is the flanker, the Sukhoi 27. It's a very good airplane, and one wants to be able to meet and better that. After much deliberation, this was the design the five European collaborators agreed to develop to meet that Soviet challenge. A single-seat, twin-engine, delta-wing, with a pair of four planes known as canards, just ahead of the cockpit. As the aircraft took shape in the silicon chip imagination of the manufacturer's supercomputers, 
the designers were figuring out not only how to build the Eurofighter, but how to fly it too. Every square inch of the structure was subjected to the varying stresses that each phase of flight would generate. Data that would then be verified against the actual results recorded on a sort of flying laboratory known as the EAP. This too would be a twin-engined, delta-winged jet with canards. EAP was funded by industry as well as by the British government to test out the new technologies that might be incorporated into the Eurofighter. Armed with the data required from each flight, the designers would be able to return to the drawing board to see whether the complex calculations of airflow, pressures and forces that the computer had come up with bore any relation to reality. But before the EAP could fly, the numerous computer designs and configurations had to be tested in the relative safety of the terrestrial wind tunnels. Different wing shapes, twin tails, different canard positions. Every possible permutation of the Eurofighter's design was hurled into the face of the artificial hurricanes that are routinely summoned up here. But in the mid-1980s, other storms were buffeting the five-nation Eurofighter project. No other government wanted to contribute to the cost of the EAP technology demonstrator. No one seemed able to agree on an ideal role for the fighter. They couldn't even agree on a name for it, so they settled on EFA, European Fighter Aircraft. And in 1984, one of the five partners, France, declined to continue if she couldn't be the leader. A year later, France pulled out. Meanwhile, the computers continued to fly their imaginary airplane through imaginary airflows, while the one and only EAP began to test the systems that had been built into it. Powered by two tornado engines, the EAP eventually flew for 195 hours, probing at the limits of low speed and high speed flight, verifying in reality what the computers had said would happen, such as how shock waves would form around the aircraft's nose as it blasted through the sound barrier. But the EAP was more than just a flying wind tunnel. One of the questions it was designed to answer was how much of EFA's load bearing structure could be made from new lightweight materials, such as carbon fiber. The technology of carbon fiber composites is now fairly well known, and it's been used in civil airliners and Formula One racing cars for years. The strength of any part depends on how many layers you use and where you put them. Nothing, it seems, could be simpler, lighter, or apparently more cost effective you can lay up carbon fiber into shapes, which if you were to make them by old fashioned methods of metal bashing, would mean a, a large number of people beating out shapes and then riveting them together or welding them together to form one complex shape. Very labor intensive, very expensive. With carbon fiber composite techniques, you can make very complex shapes very cheaply and reduce the weight. And that's a revolution, I think. Perhaps the single most important thing in EFA technology. By combining the weight savings of carbon fiber with new lightweight alloys, and by devising new construction methods which can minimize the quantity of materials needed, EFA is claimed to be 30% lighter than it would have been if manufactured in more conventional ways. Not surprisingly, weight savings of that order translate directly into increases in performance and maneuverability. But weight is only half the equation. Engine thrust is the other important variable. And for EFA, the European consortium reached the early decision to design an entirely new engine. This too will incorporate a fistful of technological firsts. But there are still some techniques of engine manufacture which are almost as old as the hills. 
We make turbine blades today almost exclusively by what's called the lost wax process. That's a process that goes back many years. Indeed, the Chinese used it over 3,000 years ago. What you do is you make a model of the blade in wax. You then coat the wax with a ceramic shell, melt the wax out. That gives you a perfect female mold in which you then create an exact replica of the wax pattern in metal. Like the aircraft it will power, the IFA engine was also a collaborative venture. Curiously, it was here, in the anticipated design requirements of the engine, that the differing combat requirements for each nation were most apparent. We start from all four nations wanting a fighter aeroplane optimized for air-to-air -air combat. But if you look at the particular threat scenarios that at least existed at the time that design was put together, in the case of the United Kingdom, we have a very large area of the north, northern coast to, to defend. And the way that is done is for, to have the, the fighter aeroplanes airborne, and therefore they have to have very low fuel consumption uh, whilst they're doing what we call combat air patrol. They then have to accelerate and intercept any would-be intruder. That contrasts with the German situation, which at the time we're talking about, of course, we still had East Germany as part of the Warsaw Pact. And West Germany, therefore, had to have an airplane that they could scramble very quickly, and they were looking for the very shortest time of intercept from ground to air mission. And while the designers were wrestling to fit the engine to those two widely differing combat needs, as well as to the plane itself, others were struggling to strike that critical balance between using proven technology and taking a gamble on innovation. You don't just go for innovative technology because it's there any more than you reject now technology because it's old. You're, you're striking a balance between the risk and the, and the proven quality. In the case of IFA, we had a tremendous advantage of a whole series of technology demonstrators. And indeed, we even had a flying vehicle, the experimental aircraft program. And that takes a great deal of the risk of these technology leaps out of the development of IFA carbon fiber technology, new construction methods, delta canards, unstable airplanes, high-speed flight control systems, that sort of thing. We're not complacent about the risk, but we know a great deal more because of the technology demonstrators. Shortly after the EAP technology demonstrator had made its last flight, the House of Commons Accounts Committee calculated that its use had saved the EFA project around 850 million pounds in development costs. And although it was never intended to be an EFA prototype, there had never been any question what this demonstrator was demonstrating. Combat-capable supersonic and subsonic maneuverability against the Soviet threat. But towards the end of 1989, something happened which was to call the entire project into question. Something unexpected, unthinkable even. The threat appeared to be crumbling away before our very eyes. Not only the Berlin Wall, but the Iron Curtain itself was being dismantled. The Warsaw Pact was quite simply disintegrating. And familiar adversaries were trampled underfoot in the rush to be free of an old tyranny. But the new tyranny of poverty, hunger and bankruptcy was no better. And on New Year's Eve 1991, the Winter Revolution of 1917 finally ended with the dissolution of the Soviet Union and the establishment of the Commonwealth of Independent States. Much of the once proud, once feared Soviet Air Force was put out to grass and some of the older, less reliable aircraft were mothballed. But there were still some pilots and some aircraft taking to the air, despite the massive fuel bills, maintaining a military presence in the uncertain times which they and their new leaders were now facing.
Others, meanwhile, were having to content themselves with more fuel-efficient training methods. In 1990, when these once-secret Soviet aircraft last convened at Farnborough, the red stars on their tail fins and wingtips told you everything you needed to know about who they were and what they were doing. The displays were designed to demonstrate skill and capability, and few who saw them were left in any doubt about either. Now, the red stars have gone. But does that mean that the threat which these aircraft used to represent has disappeared as well? They're made more significant now than they were when I started, because in those days, it was relatively simple with Warsaw Pact on one side, white hats of NATO on the other side. Now there's a proliferation of those weapons. Those aircraft are being actually sold or aggressively marketed all over the world. And God knows where they'll be in the year 2020. As the graceful Sukhoi flanker touched down on the Farnborough runway, it didn't much matter that there was no word in the Russian language for marketing. The aircraft wasn't for sale. But by 1992, both Sukhoi and MiG were turning up with what they called export versions of their most potent aircraft. That year, Farnborough was also very different for another reason too. Since last they all met, some of the pilots here had been to war in the Gulf. It was a war which for nearly a month was waged almost entirely from the air. It was also a war which seemed to vindicate the use of concentrated air power, which for so long had been advocated by the military analysts. It's a message the sales teams at Farnborough didn't hesitate to push for all it's worth. And although it was a war which saw little dogfighting, for those manufacturers whose aircraft were victorious, the grisly sales potential of successful combat was inescapable. Familiar images will resurface once more as laser-guided bombs and missiles fall unerringly towards their targets. And once more, the paradoxical message that high-technology weapons save lives and are cost-effective will again be offered up for consideration. Back at the 1992 Farnborough Air Show, there was an undercurrent of intense competition, as a number of fighters, including IFA, did battle for the attention of air forces who needed to find replacements for their aging fighter squadrons. At the top of the shopping list for many were the relatively cheap Russian-built MiGs and Sukhois, although they're not everyone's idea of a good buy. You don't buy something to finish up as parity with the threat. You go to war to win. But in fact, cost of ownership is a major consideration. And the ex-Warsaw Pact countries did not build their aircraft to last. For example, the MiG-29 has a 2,000-hour fatigue life, whereas IFA and most Western airplanes have a 6,000 hours. So you need basically three times the number of airplanes just to break the same as IFA. And then, of course, the obvious question, do you really want to be reliant on spares from downtown Russia? when you're thinking about the year 2020. And then that ignores, of course, the obvious things. The UK really ought to stay at the forefront of those sorts of technologies. We don't give all of that over to somebody else. So there's a whole complex raft of reasons why you don't just rush out and buy an airplane like the SU-27. So what could you rush out and buy? One of these, perhaps, the Saab Gripen from Sweden. It's rather small and lightweight, has only one engine, isn't very stealthy, and has limited range and payload. But it does use composite construction and computerized flight control technology.
If you'd prefer something with a little more panache and can afford to pay for it, the 42 million pound Dassault Rafale might be worth considering. And at this price, it's a true rival to the IFA. This was the aircraft the French pulled out of the IFA project to pursue on their own. And at first sight, it seems very similar. The same delta shape with canards either side of the cockpit. This too started life as a twin engine single seat fighter. But already, the Rafale was being developed into a two-seat ground attack aircraft, and the original air superiority objectives were beginning to be compromised. Like so many long-term military projects, which can take over a decade to mature, the Rafale has undergone constant modification as a result of changing political priorities within France. And as always, the balance has to be struck between capability and cost what's sometimes known as the numbers game. The numbers game with aeroplanes, should you have a few very capable aeroplanes, very expensive, very capable, do everything sort of thing, always win, or is it better to have um, a larger number of only 80% capable aeroplanes? Well, I think that's a very difficult question. It's, it's a problem that has, is getting worse and worse for everybody to solve. Take the Americans and the, and the F-22 concept of aeroplanes arguably the most capable fighter aeroplane that the world has yet designed. General, all-round, air superiority, stealthy, very agile, high angle of attack, you name it, it's got a lot. But at a price penalty. A price penalty of 70 million pounds per aircraft, the cost of a medium-sized airliner. Why so expensive? Well, among the many new features of the F-22 is a distinctive jet technology known as thrust vectoring. Rather like the Harrier, the F-22 can deflect the direction of its jet exhaust, and this results in quite extraordinary agility. But it's agility at a price which few could afford. Now, is it better to have a small number of these incredibly good airplanes, or a large number of less good ones? Well, what's the risk of a small number? Uh, you lose them through some freak of nature, the hangar roof falls down, or there's a saboteur, or they're caught on the ground, or your intelligence was wrong. Um, or you can't deploy them in time. Uh, you have to keep them all in their special base and move them to wherever they might be needed, only close to the time. You can't, you can't have them scattered around the world ready. So, you know, you have these sort of constraints with a small number. Um, but on the other hand, the pilots would say, I don't want an inferior airplane. I don't want to be one of the 500 pilots who will die when our 5,000 airplanes win the war. You can see the problem for the Western mentality that the more capability you put in the airplane, the safer the man is likely to be. You finish up, ultimately, I suppose, with one very expensive airplane, and then it's not available on the day, or somebody goes and breaks it. Which is what happened to the F-22 during its trial period. It was to have been a routine test flight combined with what's known as a photo opportunity, a press call, in other words. Everything seemed to be going well at first, but as the aircraft began to draw level with the camera, it was clear that something was seriously wrong with the controls. The thrust vectoring nozzles and the elevators seemed somehow to be out of phase with each other. The result was inevitable, but fortunately not fatal. It was exactly this kind of computer control problem which the EAP test program was designed to explore. Like the F-22, the EAP is an agile but unstable aircraft which cannot be flown without the aid of a computer. The problem is, when should that computer be allowed to overrule the pilot? You've got to ensure that whatever the pilot demands of the aircraft won't break the aeroplane, if you like, or won't cause it to depart from normal flight, enter a spin, for example, and whistle down and crash. And you've got to ensure that the pilot does not incapacitate himself. All of these things are designed into the flight control system so that if the pilot asks the aircraft to do something impossible, the aircraft won't do it. You need to have software that takes account of all the inputs and in presenting them to the pilot has its own ideas about what the pilot ought to be doing or the fact that the pilot ought to be reacting so that if it sees it's diving towards the ground at 10 feet, or if it sees a missile's only 100 feet away and about to hit it, and the pilot is doing nothing, 
then it will start questioning him about that. Now, if the pilot has departed at that stage, that's tough luck on the computer. It's probably going to about to cease to exist as well. But you can build in some sort of uh, evasive reaction. And indeed, we will build into this airplane. It's part of the scheme that where a pilot gets totally disoriented, for, for example, he can press a button which, wherever the aircraft is, recovers it to straighten level flight into a shallow climb and waits there for him to be ready to take over again. Fortunately, nearly all of these systems can be tested in the flight simulator without endangering life or limb. The simulator mimics every aspect of the aircraft's behavior and enables pilots to carry out the entire range of combat maneuvers and routine training procedures without ever leaving the ground. Bit short. As far as the computers which drive this simulator are concerned, this EFO cockpit really is flying. Flying through a virtual sky above a terrain and using up virtual fuel. A warning light or a computer synthesized voice prompts the pilot to check the fuel system. Up until now, the computers on board have been managing the fuel flow. Now, however, it's time for the pilot to do something like pull in at the nearest airborne petrol station. The computers will, of course, route the virtual fuel into the correct virtual fuel tanks and won't bother the pilot again until something else comes up. The simulator is more than just a giant arcade game, though. It's also an ergonomic laboratory in which the cockpit designers can finally assess the user friendliness of their prototype display panels. Panels which were themselves designed within the virtual world of a computer. Without ever having to bend a metal sheet or pop a rivet, these control panels can be modified by means of the touch sensitive screens on the designer's computer terminal. Once the design seems to be working, then a prototype is constructed and installed into the simulator for further testing. To date, this virtual EFA has flown for over a thousand hours and half a million virtual miles. But more importantly, it's tested systems which would take years to test in a real-life fighter plane. How then will a 21st century dogfight begin? Well, let's start in the classic way that the, the adversaries are miles apart and the first engagement is going to be beyond a visual range. Uh, for that, you need to be supersonic. You need to be able to maneuver supersonically. Clearly, you need the systems to cope with beyond visual range, radar, infrared search and track, and so on. Good pilot awareness for this man on his own. The missile for that combat is the AMRAM, the Advanced Medium Range Air-to-Air -air Missile. Once your AMRAM missiles are in the air, or so the theory goes, you can turn away and leave them to it. Their own onboard radar and computer circuitry will hunt down and destroy the target wherever it goes. But of course, your enemy has probably got something similar to AMRAM too, and therefore it's vital that he doesn't see you before you see him. This is the simple logic which drives the study of stealth technology. And here, at a radar range on the Lancashire coast, Full-sized EAP and EFA models have been zapped with every conceivable radar frequency to see how reflective they are. The results enable the engineers to incorporate stealth-enhancing changes in the shapes of certain body panels and fixings, and will also help determine which of the many radar-absorbent coatings should be used and where. For many years, the UK has been at the forefront of radar absorbent materials. So there's a whole amalgam of things. But in the case of EFA, radar stealth has to be kept in balance, in balance with agility, in balance with other features. And of course, at the end, in balance with affordability, which is why we didn't go for an all aspect stealth aircraft like the advanced tactical fighter. EFA has a job to do, which is to destroy the enemy. And to do that, it's a trade-off between can he see you and can you see him. It's no good you being so small and undetectable that you don't have room to carry a radar. You've got to have a radar which enables you to detect him. And that will typically be 
I don't know, getting on for three feet across, if you look at a modern aircraft. Now, that means that you're going to have some possibility of being seen. And it's a trade-off between the size of your aircraft, the kit it carries, uh, and its stealthiness. Clearly, every time you use a radar, you're giving away information which says, I am here. You're also giving away information, if the other chap is clever, that says, um, this is my radar, and if he has any good intelligence, he'll be able to say, ah, yes, that's a Mark I EFA or whatever. And so you need to use these things sparingly. You need to try and gather as much information as you can with the minimum possible amount of transmission of your own position. Perhaps the most effective way of doing that nowadays is by using what's called passive electro-optic sensing. This technology generates pictures from the differences in temperature between an object and its surroundings. And in this picture of a MiG taking off, the bright hot plumes of its after-burning jet exhaust show up very clearly. But electro-optic imaging can also differentiate between quite small differences in temperature, as this image of a helicopter demonstrates. The rapid movement of the tips of the rotor blades through the air has warmed them slightly, and now they glow a bit more brightly than the slower moving inner sections of the blades, which is also why the MiG's nose cone is glowing. By exploiting these minute temperature differences in the environment, it's possible to present a pilot who's flying low and at night with an image of his surroundings on a screen in the cockpit. A computer will tell him where the hills and obstacles are and will remind him to keep an eye on his altitude. It will also display all of the flight data and targeting information he may need. This technology enables pilots to fly at 500 miles per hour even when there's nothing to see outside the cockpit. However, it's now possible to display that same information to the pilot on the inside of his visor, so that wherever he looks, he sees an enhanced image of his surroundings. The effect on the pilots who've tested the night helmet in flight is dramatic. Up on the right side, there's a uh, plant, or there's a one o'clock, there's a refinery of sorts. Oh, yeah, I see it. Can't believe I'm flying 200 feet looking off to the right <laughs> side of the refinery in the middle of the night. Some things are surely amazing. The next logical step was to slave the aircraft's weapon system to the helmet to produce a helmet-mounted sight. The helmet-mounted sight is a very simple concept, really, and it is, works on the thought that you can have a sight that, since it's strapped to the pilot's head, can be exactly lined up with his normal sensors, his eyes, if you will. Uh, and by fitting sensors around the cockpit, they can determine exactly in space where that helmet is, and they can determine which way it is pointing. And that can be directed and linked directly into the weapon system and into the computer, so that when the pilot looks at something, uh, he can say to the computer, what I'm looking at now is where I want you to point and where I want you to either track or to fire a weapon. Uh, and in a sense, it's just like aiming a camera. Um, you've seen people parachuting with cameras strapped to their helmets. They have a little sight in front of their eye, and they know that if they look through that, the camera will point that way. It's a very sophisticated advance on that technique, really. And to complete the transformation from real reality to virtual reality, another of the systems being tested here invites a pilot to fly a blue brick through a computer-generated stereoscopic landscape. At the moment, the true reality of the project is that seven aircraft will be built and flown between now and the year 2000, with 600 being built for the four nations involved. Yet, in November 1992, even this was in jeopardy, as the four contributing defense ministers met to reassess the plane's costings. The Germans were coming under increasing public pressure to drop the project. But after much deliberation, they decided to continue and to rename the project Eurofighter 2000, 
mainly to counter the perceived doom and gloom which surrounded the project in Germany at the time. It's political will that starts projects, quite frankly, and it's political will that sustains them. The job of the technologist in all this is, of course, to persevere with the sort of development work that we've been speaking about, uh, but it's also very much, I suggest, to make sure that politicians, who at the end of the day run countries and take decisions, have available to them all the very best analytical data uh, and the best um, study of the technology so that when they take decisions, they can be fully aware of the implications of those decisions. And if there were one symbol of the uncertainties that perplex modern defense analysts, this would surely be it. An ex-Soviet Union MiG-29, which now sports the livery of the German Luftwaffe. The Luftwaffe inherited 24 of these planes from the East Germans after the Soviet collapse. But by the year 2010, most of the world's major air forces which now have American F-16s and F-18s, will be looking to update their squadrons. The Americans will be sure to push hard for a refit of these aging planes, as they're reluctant to sell the technology of the F-22s. Yet the argument for a new plane gathers momentum, with the obvious contenders being the Saab Gripen, Dassault Rafale, and the now newly named Eurofighter 2000. The Eurofighter is indeed living in interesting times. The courses of action open to Britain are clear, but only just. If we want an air superiority fighter, then Eurofighter seems to be the logical choice. A more difficult question is whether we actually need a 21st century Spitfire. But the thorniest question of all is whether Britain wants to maintain an aerospace industry that's capable of designing and building such aircraft. Not only the Eurofighter, but also its successors. The battlefield next tells of the decisive battle of midway between the Americans and the Japanese. America and we'll probably do the same over